Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Idol Podcast, the podcast where I do weekly book reviews. This week, I read The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Now, this book has been on my TBR for a very long time, but I guess, you know, there's no time like the present to actually visit this document and to analyze it. So this is a military strategy handbook. And it really just explains how to successfully fight and win a war by Sun Tzu. Now, the edition that I have, um, I got it off of Amazon, but it includes um, an introduction and a special chapter on Chinese warfare. And it's kind of like a background of all of the wars that were fought in that area and specifically targeting the battles that pertain to the principles in this book. Now, the original The Art of War, again, was written by Sun Tzu, who is a military strategist. In either the 5th or the 6th century, I've seen a few different dates. Um, No one really knows exactly when this book was written, um, or I guess this piece was written, but it was somewhere around there. Now, it was translated into English by Lionel Giles in 1910. And again, this is the version that I have. Um, And the introduction and Chinese warfare chapter were written by Brig General Thomas R. Phillips of the U.S. Army. And that was for the 1944 edition. And it was then republished in 2019 by Ixia Press. So you can see, you know, just through the the version that I have that this book has gone through not necessarily revisions, but um, a few translations, republications, and adding and taking things out. So with that being said, because this is such a classic foundational book, there are a plethora of versions out there. And... I don't think I have the full version. I think this one is just kind of condensed, um, especially once we get to how it's structured. But if anyone has read the actual, you know, like the full version that was written in um, Sun Tzu's language, I would love to hear like if there were any differences or even where to buy it so I can compare and contrast. Um, But yeah, I got mine off of Amazon. I think it was like $8 or so. So it's, it's very, it's very short. It is 90 pages and between the introduction and the special chapter, um, on Chinese warfare that takes up about 30 pages. So with the 13 chapters, um, or principles that leaves about, you know, 60 pages to go around. So this book is very short and that's why I'm theorizing that I don't have the full version But either way, you know, the message, I think, is still very clear. Now, I'll go ahead and list the 13 chapters. Um, The first one is Laying Plans, Waging War, Attack by Stratagem, Tactical Dispositions, Use of Energy, Weak Points and Strong, Maneuvering an Army, Variations of Tactics, The Army on the March, Classification of Terrain, The Nine Situations, Attack by Fire, and lastly, Use of Spies. So again, you know, those are all like a few pages each and it tackles um, a specific topic of warfare within. So as far as writing style, this is an interesting book for me to have read and reviewed just because it was obviously written so long ago that I'm just not familiar with the way that this author speaks, you know, and and writes to get across to an audience. Even when I read the book about the Roman Empire, it was written by someone who is living and breathing, you know, the same era that I am right now. So it's hard to kind of get on that playing field. But once you listen to the next few points that I have, and you're able to level with Sun Tzu, 
then you can kind of breeze past the, the style and the tone of the writing to ultimately receive the message. And that's another thing when it comes to the republication of um, books like this is that a lot of times there is an effort to modernize the text. And I think this is kind of like a a hot button amongst readers and liter literary critics because in doing that you do take away some of the essence of the original author but at the same time you kind of want the the audience in the now to be able to understand what's happening and because you know culturally and, and language wise things just change so of course we're not able to relate to things that happened thousands and thousands of years ago but through the help of people kind of revisiting these pieces and, and making the necessary adjustments, even if that's just including footnotes to explain, you know, certain verbiage or, or situations, it does add context to or for the audience. I would describe his style as aphoristic because an aphorism is just a statement of truth or opinion expressed in a concise and witty manner. Keyword, concise. So this is kind of like those old sayings um, that we've all heard before that make a lot of sense. And the, the more you think about it, you know, you see where the wisdom comes in, but it's just a very quick saying that kind of gets passed down through generations. And that's certainly the way he talks. He doesn't really come out and say, this is bad and this is good. He you know, gives you one of those sayings and then he explains it. And then he also does a very good job of reinforcing this information through repetition. I don't know if that was intended or not, but there are um, multiple, t multiple points in each chapter where the information kind of overlaps. And so you're, you're getting, you know, a reinforcement of his conclusion in a previous chapter again. The tone of the book is very philosophical. The definition of uh, philosophy is just a rational investigation of truths and principles of being, knowledge, and conduct. Obviously, we're talking here about military conduct and the knowledge of warfare itself and treating it like a science. And so this is something that's very, um, very, what's the word? Not in depth, introspective, like you're looking into the art of war, essentially. Now, with that being said, I did find that there's kind of like this under underlying tone of deception and not necessarily in a bad way, because when we're talking about war, you know, all bets are off. You're really just positioned to do the best for your side and that's it. And by using terms like maneuver or deviate, you know, positioning your, your army, your men in a better position than the enemy, you know, in that there lies deception. There is obviously a chapter on spies in this. So there's kind of like that slimy feeling of, okay, well, you kind of have to, you know, screw some people over, but then you remember, oh, we're talking about war. So makes a lot of sense. Now, if the book had a voice, I would say it's certainly wisdom. And the, the real life examples that we can kind of attribute to this that aren't even mentioned in the book, like maybe some things that happened, you know, 40, 50 years ago, show that you can actually trust the messenger because the, the advice is very sound and truthful. So all in all, I would say this is an expository narration because it's just intending to explain something to you. You can argue that it's you know persuasive however when you put this book up against the test of time the quote-unquote advice has been proven so it's not like it's really we don't need to sway you to think this way like this is a fact and it's really up to you to take heed of you know what's being presented Now, there aren't characters in this book in the, the um, traditional sense, but there are figures that he refers to. Um, 
the most important that I pulled out were the generals, the officers, and of course the enemy. And this is because the general is someone who is positioned at the top of, you know, the military. And they're also essentially taking orders from the ruler, whoever that is, whether it's the the president, the prime minister, the dictator, whoever. But they're the ones, the generals have to be the most intelligent on war tactics because they are responsible for thousands, probably millions of people under them that are going to, you know, position themselves against the enemy. The officers being below the general, but above, you know, the rest of the men, they have to really be very loyal, but also courageous and have the ability to lead the men to the best, lead the men to the best of their ability, but also to kind of trust the general to point them in the right direction. And I loved the conversation on how to treat, um, how to treat how how the military personnel whether you're an officer whether you're just you know a regular um, person in the army how everyone should conduct themselves as a member of the team everyone has a role to play and when when the general is kind of off balance it throws everything else off you know if you treat your men bad do you really think that they're going to fight their best for you or even for themselves? So I enjoyed that conversation because it shows that there can be a weakness within your team if you don't lead them the correct way. So that was pretty good. And that wasn't actually like one specific chapter. It was kind of, you know, throughout the book, which obviously makes sense. Um, but this was just one way that he used these figures to explain how everyone should conduct themselves and what they are bringing to the table and how they can, you know, ultimately bring that table down. So, and with the enemy, I think the main thing that I gathered from this is obviously the enemy should be manipulated as much as possible into a position that puts them kind of, you know, um, in a place to fail but they also, they also need to be studied. And I don't know much about like warfare strategy or anything, but I always wondered how much effort goes into understanding who you are fighting against. Because that's one thing that Sun Tzu uh, repeats and reinforces is that if you know your capabilities and you know the strong points and the weaknesses of your army and you know the weaknesses and strong points of the enemy, then there's nothing really to worry about. But if you're just so wrapped up in what you can do, what you can bring to the table and you go into a situation blind, I really don't think that's, and Sun Tzu, you know, is saying that's not favorable for you. You have to understand who you're up against. So... And I think that's probably something that happens pretty regularly at this point, but you have to understand, you know, who you're playing against because that's going to determine the game that you're playing. Okay, only a couple of themes that I pulled out. I mean, there's a lot that you can really take away from this book, but what I really saw, and I actually looked online too, and um, these were... Uh, some of the repeated themes that kept popping up when I was looking at other analysis and things like that is number one, the path of least resistance. Essentially, the message of this story is you need to prepare yourself, prepare your men and study the enemy as much as possible so that you're not going into battles unnecessarily. When you're talking about a war, you're more than likely talking about a few key major battles, probably an ongoing um, effort to extend borders or whatever may have you. And you want to make sure that you can ensure longevity and not tire your side out too quickly. So that part of that is obviously knowing the, the physical locations of the battlefields, knowing that it's probably better if you 
if you're not, what was one of the ones? Um, if an enemy is uphill, you really shouldn't be trying to fight. You shouldn't be walking up a hill to fight an enemy if they're uphill. That's not really going to, that's not really going to go well for you. Um, but stuff like that, but also just understanding that if you don't need to fight another battle, then you should not fight another battle. And you would think that would be common sense, but when you start to put human emotion into situations like pride, you know, people kind of lose their minds. So making sure that you're on the path that is one going to bring you success and if there are multiple pathways to that multiple pathways to a victory you need to choose the easiest one because there are a lot of people that are under you and this is assuming that you know the general is making these decisions and you want to make sure that you limit you know fatalities casualties but also just overall um fatigue you know because you, you need those men to continue fighting if you have to. And secondly, the whole yin and yang thing. So this is one of those, you know, that kind of contributes to the aphoristic. Aphoristic? Am I saying that right? Where is that? A yeah, aphoristic um, style. Because he's always talking in like this versus that, dark versus light, sun versus moon, uphill versus downhill, which is easy for all of us to understand because we're, we're talking in comparisons here. We're talking opposites, uh, two sides of one coin, and which one is the best for any given position. Now, the author intention is very simple. I think it's very pure literally just it's giving direction to generals on warfare you know you it's not like there's an underlying motivation here this is literally a very raw version of what to do and what not to do it doesn't really need much more than that there's no long-winded uh conversations it just is what it is so with that being said I know this was like a super short analysis, but now um, for my review, I think that especially my book, it's a footnote of several footnotes. Um, the art of war combines discipline and strategy, and that's really it. And I think that the tone is particularly cunning and a correct analysis of warfare. So, you know, everything is pretty much a fact in here, especially when we're looking at that time period. And we're really just talking about the, the capabilities of the people in charge. Now, hopefully, most of us won't ever experience fighting in a war. So in order to find I guess the motivation to continue reading this or even to be able to insert yourself into the narrative I would suggest reading it as a metaphor so you can apply these lessons to your life there's a lot of double meanings here for example you can you can kind of position this as like a workplace situation a team situation where the leader your, your boss or the supervisor is the general, you know, things like that, or even just business competitors. One quote that you could easily, you know, take from this book and apply it to your life is um, the ruler is heedful and the general is full of caution. This essentially means you're keeping your country or, you know, your team at peace with the team intact and that's very important i think that that specifically can be applied to a lot of workplaces um a lot of a lot of places are at war right now with like a labor shortage because people are just kind of you know in and out but again the person at the top has to you know know what they're doing and then the general whoever is overseeing and directly influencing and communicating with the rest of the team needs to understand the situations and be full of caution you know because the workplace right now everywhere is just kind of terrible so i think that if more than like military people read this book they would be able to apply it to their lives it's not difficult 
to kind of swap the words out and be able to see where it is, you know, your team or your business went wrong against whatever you're fighting against, whether it's another competitor or it's an internal issue or whatever it may be. The advice essentially still remains sound regardless. So now I do think that because this book is so foundational and so it's such a core part of history at this point, most of these principles are kind of common sense and and maybe not common sense, but they're just so ingrained in society. Like, of course, you know, there's certain things you don't do in warfare. There's just certain things that you are aware of. And I think at this point, you know, most of the, the top ranking military strategists are aware of this. And if the book is this short for real, they all could probably read it, you know, and it would help contribute. So, I mean, it's not like there's anything super new in this book but again it's still it still very much remains and stands against the test of time if I could critique one thing though the structure is kind of all over the place but I will say that that shows that it really was very pure and genuine when he was writing it because when when you have something that needs to come out of you and you feel like you need to put it on a piece of paper something you're passionate about in this case, warfare, he's just kind of writing down all of the points that he wants to get across to the, the generals, to the audience. But it's like, it kind of doesn't make any sense. If it were me, I would restructure it so that he's explaining things as warfare progresses. So maybe from the beginning, you know, all the way up till the end of the victory or, you know, the loss, whatever you may have you. I would have chapter eight close out the book because chapter eight is variations of tactics. And one thing that he keeps saying is that all of this is very true. Yes. But one thing to keep in mind is once you win a war, it's very unlikely if you go into war again, that you're going to win the war the same exact way. So you need to really take all of this advice, all of these principles and apply them to the special situations, you know, cause they're not always going to be the same. And so that's the most important distinction out of everything is that it's not enough to understand, you know, which part of the terrain you should be fighting on. You need to know that if there were another factor in this, then that could change, you know, your decision. So I would close it with that just to reinforce there that, um, it's really about understanding the whole and not necessarily one principle over the other. Also, the whole chapter about fire, like, at this point, it's kind of outdated. I mean, they're just talking about throwing fire bombs and stuff. I mean, I don't know. I, but again, if you take out too much or change too much, it, it takes away from what the author originally, you know, intended. So, but that's just my little itty bitty critique. But honestly, is this a reread? Yes. And I think that upon rereading the 60 pages, you can focus on one aspect at a time. You know, pull out, maybe just read the chapter about the terrain, you know, and, and understanding why it's important to be on dry land versus wetland and things like that. And just, you know, grab those little pieces of wisdom throughout because there is there is a lot of information in these few pages um but it, you can catch the general gist of things after the first read i think it would be cool though to go back and just reread each chapter alone and see you know what you can pull out of it so so that's it i mean it's a short episode because it's a short book <laughs> so and everything is certainly self-explanatory i don't think you really have to look into things too much once you get past you know the the style of writing you can really understand exactly what Sun Tzu is saying so the only takeaway I have here is that readers should retain the knowledge and then exercise your best judgment to succeed so that's all um either next week or the week after I will be reviewing The Art of War for Writers by James Scott Bell, which is actually really interesting. 
So this review is coming up. Um, I have a few books that I'm reading that they are they were either adapted into films or series and so I'm gonna get those out um, this month one of them is the second Bridgerton book so that's gonna you know because the second season is premiering on Netflix soon so I will have that book reviewed and then um, no exit by I want to say Taylor Adams and there's another book that was just recently adapted. So that's kind of everything that's going to be on the horizon for March. Um, and you never know. I might just throw in a random book here and there because I got enough of them. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode. I will see you all next week. I hope everyone has a lovely weekend. And that is all. Stay safe.